Okay, welcome everybody to this colloquium. Today, it's a pleasure to have Stephen Moishes in our colloquium. Stephen is a triple pro professor, at least. So in Earth Sciences, uh, awarded in the US, in Germany, and in Vienna. Uh, and he, is, uh, yeah, he has traveled a lot around the world. He, was in, he started his career in the US. So he was in Houston, then in Boston, and San Diego. He was in Los Angeles and California. Uh, then he moved to, to Europe. He was in France, in Switzerland, in the UK, in Germany, and finally also in Austria. Uh, before he actually started his last position now in Budapest, in Hungary, he is uh, the research, the, sorry, the research advisor at the Origins Research Institute in Budapest at the moment. And yeah, I, I know Stephen from some meetings. So I think from, you know, when, when we had the rise of the exoplanets, he was one of the persons who pioneered this, um, yeah, this, this interlinkage between geology and astronomers. Uh, and when we met, we, we had some really interesting discussions about phyllosilicates and you know, what we can learn from fossil records in meteorites, from element abundances, isotopic ratio, et cetera, about the formation of the solar system. He's, uh, he has published a lot. Uh, in the area of, say, chemical evolution of planets, uh, of Mars in particular, uh, on the origin of life in general. And he, yeah, more recently, he worked also a lot of, on exoplanets themselves, yeah, on exoplanet evolution, and also what I've seen a little bit on protoplanetary disks as well. So today, it's a pleasure to have he, him here in, with his talk. Uh, where, where he will introduce us to the Lomonosov-Lavoisier bridge between non-life and life. Okay, over to you, Stephen. Peter, thank you very much. Uh, I want to begin, of course, by uh, thanking, thanking colleagues at um, the Institute for uh, Space Research in Graz, in Austria. And I'd like to thank uh, Peter Hoitke, of course, uh, for that very kind introduction. And also uh, congratulate your um, institute uh, with the new directories, uh, Christiana Helling, uh, who I also met at the Erwin Schrodinger Institute uh, in Wien a couple of years ago when we ran this meeting on, on early solar systems. And of course, it's a pleasure to, um, to see colleagues again, and also to uh, be speaking to a group that includes um, uh, Helmut Lamar and Luca uh, Fossati, and other distinguished colleagues, junior researchers, students, and so on, interested in solar systems, in chemistry, and the physics of exoplanets. I also wanted to say it's a tough act to follow. Uh, I was at Ted Bergen's um, remote talk I think it was last month. And uh, of course, Ted is an excellent speaker. So uh, I will try to do my best under the circumstances. But as Peter mentioned, uh, my presentation has this catch-all title about chemistry and geology and non-life and life. But I would like to just encapsulate all of these different ideas into one simple idea. And the fact is that I'm a geologist. I study places like this. Uh, our planet Earth is my natural test bed for uh, exploring the chemistry of planets. And because I'm a geologist, I like to take all of this tremendous complexity and boil it down into something simpler. And so that's where the concept of uh, geoastronomy comes in. And uh, this is a project that we've initiated here in Budapest at the Konkoi Observatory uh, with my uh, colleague, uh, Maria Lugaro, who many of you know, she's one of the foremost uh, nuclear astrophysicists and uh, including uh, working with Maria, it's my uh, great pleasure to also be working with Kevin Hung, who also many of you know, is at the University of Bern 
but uh, shall soon be moving his operations to the LMU in Munich. And also to work with uh, Jens Huymakers, who's at the University of Lund. And uh, these three people bring many different facets of expertise to the problem of understanding exoplanets. So these planets are more than just balls of rock and metal. And with nuclear astrophysics, atmospheric physics, and observational techniques and observational astronomy, we hope to be able to tackle the problem of what is the nature of exoplanets, and finally to be able to place our own Earth within the context of uh, exoplanets. So what I will talk about today is, uh, has a lot to do with the chemistry of planets. And in particular, my focus will be on life, but it won't be exclusively life. I mean, life has only been found on the earth. So we have to start there with something. And we know something about the conditions for, for life on earth. So I will review some of these from a planetary perspective. If there's time, I'd like to uh, talk to you about the chemistry of planets that are long gone. And the astronomical community has been investigating these. And I'd like to uh, say a few words about that and end with some musings. There are something on the order of 200 billion stars in our galaxy. This is of course the famous uh, composite image from the ESA's Gaia survey showing the plane of the galaxy and the dust and of course, uh, the Magellanic clouds, probably almost all of these stars have planets around them. Stars, uh, a topic of um, interest to astronomers since the beginning of astronomy, are actually rather simple objects physically. You may balk at what I say, but you'll see what I mean in just a moment. I mean, for example, Stars can be plotted on a diagram just comparing their brightness, luminosity against that of the sun versus temperature. Of course, everybody knows about this Hertzsprung Russell diagram. However, stars, they come in many different sizes and masses, and that is equated in their luminosity as well as in their lifetimes and to some degree in their compositions. And of course, our star is a G-type star. Uh, K stars are very, very interesting because they are very, very long live stars. F stars are interesting too. They're very bright, relatively short-lived compared to our star. But there is no Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for planets. And you can see that easily just by plotting the planets of our own solar system. The, the zoo of possibilities chemical and physical possibilities is so great that it seems daunting to try to attempt to classify planets. I don't think that should prevent us from trying, but you know, you hear about things like, uh, you know, gas giants and Neptunes and Earths, and then in between super Earths not represented in our solar system sub Neptunes not represented in our solar system. And then all the way down to something like 10% of the mass of the earth, in this case, Mars, and then icy worlds, which are uh, relegated to the uh, outer part of our solar system. So in light of that little preamble, I want to underscore for you a geologist view of planets and stars and planetary systems. That is that they're not just balls of rock and metal. They're not just mass radius density age relationships. Uh, and if you want to know if life ever could have emerged on such worlds, well, you have to contend with four key issues. And the first is that liquid water ought to be present in the system. And you may ask, well, what about alternative uh, 
liquids, uh, maybe alternative solvents. I don't know another solvent that behaves like liquid water does. It's got a wide range of stability and pressure temperature space. And it's made from uh, two of the four most abundant elements in the universe. So water should be everywhere. Furthermore, you ought to have organic chemical building blocks. These are also present uh, everywhere in the cosmos that we look at giant molecular clouds and so forth. And of course, free energy, but energy isn't just free. It should be from chemical disequilibria where there is a flow of electrons from electron donors to electron acceptors. So a redox gradient is promoted. Um, that is something that is best accomplished on planets, planets that have interiors that are relatively reduced and therefore electron rich flowing from the interior to the surface, which is a relatively oxidized sy system, a uh, milieu. And this flow of electrons ultimately powers the chemistry that leads to life, even though it's subordinate these days to the biosphere, which is powered mostly by photosynthesis. But the last one is the one that most people forget about, that none of the physical chemical processes that will lead to life will occur overnight, nor indeed will they occur in a million years or 10 million years or maybe 30 million years. So time is required. So the kind of chemistry that we're interested in when searching for life uh, on other planets, around other stars, requires that uh, those systems be stable over geological time uh, periods. So the hypothesis is that life will arise when all of these different criteria are met that I mentioned, but the first steps are the most difficult, as my friend Mike Russell uh, would point out. So I'm going to build bridges here between disciplines because that's what I like to do. I find it very enriching. Here, I'll take an example from Pont de Gare in uh, Provence, a first century uh, common era aqueduct system, and uh, remind us all that, uh, you know, however much we think we've got new ideas, it, if you do a little bit of digging, other people have come up with those ideas before, even if they were a bit mutated. And what I'm talking about today uh, is actually an I a suite of ideas that uh, emerged in the 18th century with the work of uh, Lomonosov in the Russian Empire and uh, Lavoisier in France, who pointed out that the chemistry of life is peculiar in that it uses a relatively small number of nuclides with a tremendous complexity in chemistry, so complex that we may not have the vocabulary to understand it. So that even if we were able to create life from scratch in the laboratory, that actually doesn't mean that's how it formed. And furthermore, we, we may not have the, the uh, mental faculty to understand the, the complexity of the chemistry leading to life. So that's just with a few nuclides. But uh, these workers, and I call it the lomonosov lavoisier bridge, pointed out that uh, the, all the rest of the elements in the periodic table make tremendous numbers of compounds, but the chemistry is actually quite simple and leads to predictable results, especially when it comes to minerals. So I'm going to emphasize now the take home points for this talk um, that specifically uh, Dobzhansky over here is famously quoted for saying that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, Darwinian evolution. Well, my uh, professor at UC San Diego, Stanley Miller, used to say, well, the origin of life is the origin of evolution, because before that, it's just complex chemistry. There isn't an ancestor descendant relationship. Now, I would add uh, that a corollary to that statement would be that the origin of evolution itself 
is the origin of information. The information molecule that all life uses, DNA, is just that. But that information could not have come out of nowhere. So there must be something that yields that information. And my idea is that the crustal platforms of planets and their mineral payload, uh, like what is found on the Earth and possibly Mars, provide the informational template. Minerals are the bridge between the non-living and living world. And so to understand propensity for a biosphere to exist on some planet, we need to understand planets. And to understand planets, we need to study rocks and stars in an integrative way. That's what I call geoastronomy. Prior to World War II, Science was very parochial. If you were a physicist, you did physics, a chemist did chemistry, a geologist did geology, and an astronomer did astronomy, and a biologist studied biology. Then fields began to get blended. Physics and geology came together to give us geophysics and plate tectonics theory. Geochemistry and geology came together to give us geochemistry and such things as age of the Earth. Geology and biology have come together to give us a, an exciting new field called geobiology, which is studying the interface of the biosphere and the geosphere. I think it's time that we unite the fields of geology and astronomy to create a new field called geoastronomy, because nothing in the study of planets makes sense except in light of the evolution of the elements. And that's something that, of course, one of my great scientific heroes, Marie Skłodowska Curie, pointed out in her own investigations of minerals. So, what makes a planet like the Earth habitable? Well, you need to have a planet, right, that has this has this uh, uh, battery type electron uh, gradient in it, from a reduced interior to an oxidized exterior. But you also need to have liquid water. Well, um, if you just plot the thermodynamic properties of water, you find that there are opportunities for living things to live on Earth at tremendous pressures and even at a huge range of temperatures. And you know, the, this little green rectangle, I hope you can see it here, is kind of common, familiar Earth life. But Earth life can actually inhabit this big square of area here in this PT diagram. Mars and Mars's crust and its interior overlaps considerably, considerably at the present day with this uh, living biosphere potential that I mentioned. And even Venus's atmosphere here in this little corner here, the upper part of the atmosphere satisfies that criterion. That's not to say that life is in any of these other places, but there doesn't seem to be anything mitigating its presence. Yet, yet, Earth's total habitable volume is subordinate. It's actually very small compared to the habitable volume of the solar system. If you just take that PT diagram that I showed you for water and you plot the habitable volumes of different solar system objects, you find that the cumulative value for all trans-Neptunian objects of liquid water is a thousand times greater than that of the Earth. That means that it's out here where most of our solar system's liquid water is present. It's out here in cloaked oceans at the, in the uh, scattered disk and in the Kuiper belt and in the population of trans-Neptunian objects. It's not way in board towards the sun where the naked oceans of the earth are, but there's a problem. Uh, grave limitations exist to biospheres in such places because you cannot melt rock. Sure, you have liquid water around, but it's all at two degrees centigrade. There is no uh, electronic gradient. Unless you can melt rock, you bring everything to thermodynamic equilibrium because 
you basically hydrolyze rock. And it's been going on within Triton, and it's been going on within Europa and these other worlds for billions of years. So we have to turn our attention to terrestrial worlds if we have any hope of finding life elsewhere. But what's a terrestrial type planet? I mean, the mass of Mars to about the six of Earth, six times Earth's mass, may be a terrestrial type planet. Smaller than Mars becomes so thermally quiet and they cool so quickly that it's, it's hard to melt rock anymore. And anything that's larger than about six Earth masses tends to flip over uh, towards a mini Neptune or an ice dwarf. Um, so we're gonna stick with these kinds of planets when we discuss what a terrestrial type planet is in our universe. But what about planetary diversity itself? I mean, these are questions that we must ask ourselves if we're interested in this Lomonosov Lavoisier bridge between non-life and life because planets are the actors in that chemistry. And well, a planet has to be stable. You need to have time in order to have this chemistry take place. Uh, in time, I mean billions of years. A dynamical path has to exist that leads to such a planet, that it has a credible origin, that it's not in a system that seems squirrely with uh, nice, stable, uh, low uh, eccentricity orbits, and then one with some wild orbit in there. Uh, that requires a credible origin. And then finally, something that I think we should all begin to think about some more, is that is the, co is the uh, planet cosmochemically plausible? Are the starting components available in abundance in the universe? And this point is made here in this diagram. This is an abundance diagram and mass fraction of solar system material against mass number, uh, the proton plus neutron number. Of course, hydrogen and helium are over here. Their nucleosynthetic pathways are from the Big Bang synthesis itself. And then down to uh, lighter elements here and different nucleosynthetic pathways that I've indicated, all the way to the uh, thorium and uranium. Unlike, I mean, there's a paper came out recently from a colleague at Harvard that proposed maybe you could make habitable interstellar wandering rogue planets uh, because these planets inherited 10,000 times higher abundance of thorium and uranium. No, that is not cosmochemically plausible. Uh, these things form by neutron star mergers and so on. Um, it's not a common enough event to make lots and lots of thorium and uranium. Potassium, on the other hand, is, a, is an interesting and important one that I think we should pay more attention to because this heats planetary interiors for the first two billion years of their history. Now, it's within that oval that most of the biological elements reside. So there's nothing about nucleosynthesis that mitigates against the chemistry of biology occurring in the cosmos. These are common elements and they're widely distributed in the galaxy. And if you put all of this together into a scenario for galactic chemical evolution leading to planet formation, and then subsequently letting that planet evolve chemically into what we think occurred in our system with a pre-RNA world where self-organizing chemical systems led ultimately to heredity based on simple RNA templates, a so-called RNA world, eventually to an RNA protein world. The paper was just published today by the Munich group of Thomas Carell, showing a plausible prebiotic pathway to an RNA protein world. I view this as a major step forward. But uh, the crystallization of the genome of all living things today occurred here at the last universal common ancestral population, which gave rise to the bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, things with cells like ours. 
Planets, though, are the ultimate template for this evolution. So what about source materials for the chemistry leading to life? Well, Stanley shared this figure with me 25 years ago. And the thinking, even though it's an old visual, hasn't changed very much. And it's time to update it because uh, ideas about organic material uh, provided by, for instance, input from cometary dust or UV light and, or hydrothermal vents and so on, has actually changed dramatically over the years. And a lot of this is driven by, for instance, the kind of work that goes on in Graz and here in Budapest and also elsewhere on disk physics and uh, planet formation and the history of late accretion. So to bring us up to speed a little bit, I'm showing this diagram. This is from a paper we published uh, just a few years ago on late accretion. Um, this is the cumulative crater frequency. This is, you can view it simply as flux. High flux here, low flux here, against time in millions of years ago. I've divided the time here in geologic time eons for Earth. Hadean from before about 3.85 billion years ago, and the Archean from 3.85 billion to two and a half billion years ago. This figure here shows different models for late accretion, in this case for lunar impact fluxes. We can, we can scale it to the Earth if you want, and which I'll show later uh, something that we did. But this work shows monotonic declines in late accretion. No late heavy bombardments, no impact cataclysms, and so on. And the reason for that is that the impact cataclysm idea actually emerged thanks to the sampling bias of the Apollo program, which only sampled an area equivalent to about 12% of the surface of the moon. We now know that um, that is an unusual area and analysis of asteroidal meteorites in particular uh, permitted us to show this new monotonic decline curve. Well, this curve is a mass production curve for the delivery of material to Earth in its early stages. Impact rates on the Earth from comets, leftover planetesimals, and the so-called E-belt, an extension of the asteroid belt that has since been emptied out thanks to late accretion, versus time is shown here. This is published in Moises et al. in 2019 and another paper by my colleague Ramon Brasser, who sits right over there uh, at our institute here in 2020. The dominant, the dominant late accretion materials striking Earth as modeled here are from a group of meteorites called ensitichondrites. Ensitichondrites have, are the group of meteorites closest to the Earth in composition. They therefore point to a formation mechanism where Earth's formation occurred in a local feeding zone. And that is different for the moon and it's different for Mars and in, you'll see in these papers for, uh, as we propose for Venus. We can take these mass production functions versus time using known compositions of ensitichondrates and compute the delivery of prebiotically relevant nuclides like phosphorus to the Earth's surface during late accretion. This was reported by us in um, 2020 with the group at, uh, at Cambridge at MRC, John Sutherland and Dougal Ritson showing that uh, there was plenty of phosphorus being delivered. This is in kilograms per year, equated over the entire surface. And then by the area, we were able to compute the, um, the mass per square meter delivered per year uh, in different um, uh, biologically relevant nuclides. Um, on top of that, and I will show that in just a moment, on top of that, and this is a paper that's now in press in the journal Astrobiology by Elisa Biondi, the Earth's surface was periodically covered in melt pools. Glass formation took place. 
water, glass, materials being delivered by uh, extraterrestrial input, all participated in this chemical brew that led to uh, the emergence of the biosphere, we think. And that's discussed in detail in this paper. Uh, people can ask me about it after the talk. What about volatiles? What about water? Where did water come from? Is water indigenous to the earth? Or did it fly in from comets? Or, or what is the story there? From the point of view of geochemists, water is indigenous to the earth. And the reason for that is that analysis of not just the hydrogen isotopes, but also the nitrogen isotopes by colleagues like Bernard Marti and also Serafian et al. and Piani et al. show that Earth and Vesta and Mars and many ordinary chondrites and now even the ancetite chondrites, which are very, very dry, but D to H was recently measured in there, ancetite chondrites, they all plot here in a mixing relationship with the end product protosolar value. Comets, on the other hand, are way off. Jupiter family comets or cloud comets, these things from nitrogen isotopes uh, show us that the volatiles were not delivered by some late veneer of material. Or if they were, uh, they were very, very minor compared to what was trapped in the building blocks that went into making the planets themselves, at least the sample planets. So the summary of volatiles then, at least for our own system, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is probably the case for other solar systems too, is that uh, water was delivered toward the end of Earth's accretion from its primary building blocks, not by comets, not by late veneers and not by fictional late heavy bombardments. And they're also arguments that are consistent with dynamical models of planet formation. I told you, and I promised you that I would show you this figure. This is a figure taking the mass production function uh, for different, um, for antitichondrites versus time and the payload of antitichondrites. And for fun here, I plotted in this horizontal line, the sulfur content of Earth's continental crust. At some point in history, the amount of sulfur coming in per year was equivalent to that of what, is, what was delivered to Earth's continental crust by, and then multiplied by factors of 10 to the five. There was a lot of material coming in. On down here, because I'm a geologist and I work on these things, I plot the oldest terrestrial materials and terrestrial rocks for which we have samples. The Acasta Nice here is 4 billion years old. Uh, I have samples of this rock. It formed at a time when nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and sulfur were delivered to Earth's surface. And I think we should try to look for evidence of this delivery in the world's oldest rocks. And people have barely done this. I, to me, this is low hanging scientific fruit. And late accretion bombardments are not unique to the Earth. Uh, you in Graz know this. I mean, late, a general feature of young systems is that they have a tendency to be dusty this is age of star in, in millions of years. There are some, this is from George Rieke's work. There are some disks that show infrared excesses around their stars. Um, this dust production also seems to decline with stellar age. This is from Carpenter et al. But there's, many, there's much other work uh, that similarly comes to this conclusion. We don't know enough to say whether this is the rule or the exception for young systems, but I think it should not come as a surprise that late accretion is a, a crucial part of the early history of any planetary system. So where do we take this? Well, I promised you geoastronomy is this bridge between planets and stars and non-living and living world. 
if we step back, really step back and look at the galaxy and try to understand how does galactic history translate into the chemical history of the galaxy that is in turn implanted in the kind of stars and planets that form planetary systems at different times in the galaxy. This is something we investigated with uh, my former student, Elizabeth Frank, and published a paper in 2014. And subsequently, uh, a lot of work lately with Haiyang Wang at uh, ETH said, and um, colleagues here um, at, at uh, Konkoi Observatory. I mentioned that looking up at the sky, every star you see probably has planets around it. In fact, um, the planet discovery rate is following a kind of Moore's law progression, like what we see in computing power, um, with over 5,000 planets now discovered to date. This is a little figure I came up with in, um, on account of the 60th anniversary of the Drake equation, which I published in Nature Astronomy uh, in November last year. How do we understand the chemical context of planets in the galaxy it seems to be a big problem. Well, the galaxy is a chemical reactor with uh, infall of raw material, it's hydrogen and helium to the galactic plane uh, and leading to uh, a mixture of that infall material with pre-processed material in the interstellar medium goes into molecular clouds, leading to star and planet formation, and that uh, these stars evolve, they go through their lifetimes, they uh, release metals into the surroundings that then gets mixed right back into the disk, gas, and dust. So there's this blender that um, evolves with time. And I'm going to borrow a phrase that um, know thy star, know thy planet, kind of know thy neighbor, know thy, thyself, one can take the composition of a star, which in the case of our solar system represents more than 99% of the mass of the solar system. So the composition of the solar system is defined by the composition of our sun. The same would be true for any planets around stars. We can take, for instance, uh, the sun's composition, devolatilize it, that is, take the element abundances, fractionate it as a function of their condensation temperature, and get within a few percent of the known bulk Earth value. High-quality spectroscopic data from stars can be used in a similar fashion to deduce or place quantitative constraints on known exoplanets orbiting those stars. This is happening right now, and a paper that is now in press uh, in monthly notices, um, we just fixed the page proofs last night, uh, will appear showing this for 13 sunlight stars in the neighborhood. This is new data. So I took some uh, really beautiful data from um, uh, observations of uh, high quality ages of stars, against such things as the ratio of magnesium to silicon, which is not fractionated between star and planet. Look, magnesium and silicon are way up here. So more or less the magnesium silicon ratio of sun is the same as that of the earth, is the same as that of Venus, of Mercury, of Mars, et cetera. Well, Earth and the sun plots right about here at 4.56 billion years. Now, stars that are somewhat older than the Earth tend to have higher magnesium silicon ratios. Higher magnesium silicon ratio would translate into a planet that has silicate mantles that are very olivine rich. Olivine is a mineral like is that uh, dominates the rheology of our mantle. That's easy to break, it can convect, it loses heat easily from planet interiors, but the trend is that younger stars should have planets around them with lower magnesium to silicon ratios, 
such lower ratios lead to a very, very different kind of mantle state. Younger, hotter, pyroxene-rich mantles. Pyroxene is a mineral that's mechanically much stronger than olivine. It's difficult to break. These planets would have difficulty convecting unless they heated up so much that they reach their convective regime, convect quickly, lose heat, degas, overcool, and then go back again to a cooling state. These data are unpublished. I have some even newer data that I will show in a moment, but the difference between an olivine dominated mantle and a pyroxene dominated mantle is also the difference between an oxidized, oxygen rich, poor an electron mantle that would degas CO2 and H2O versus a reduced hydrogen rich, lots of electron mantle that would tend to degas hydrogen and methane. That makes interesting predictions for the kind of planets that you will see around stars that are terrestrial type planets or stars of different ages. Rock forming elements can be modeled using galactic chemical evolution models as we have done here. You can use observations here like this ternary diagram of magnesium, silicon and iron showing sun-like stars and the sun and the earth in here that these stars of different ages ought to yield and also different compositions ought to yield vastly different uh, kinds of terrestrial type planets around them. So new work just this week verifies our GC model. This is from Nissen 2020 showing this decline of magnesium silicon. Here, here's the sun for reference with galactic time. So there ought to be a dichotomy in the kinds of planets uh, in the history of the galaxy. Earth, Moon, and Mars. These are the sampled worlds of our solar system plus the asteroids of the asteroid belt. Finally, observations like the ones that I've been sharing with you now allow us to place the chemistry of our solar system in a broader galactic context. And so I want to now come to the conclusion slide because I'm keeping an eye on the time. I want to have lots of time for discussion. And remind everyone that there are a number of problems that we need to face as people who want to investigate geoastronomy. The first is that like planets, the whole concept of habitability is itself not formally classified. And even with a loose definition, is not represented by the naked oceans of the Earth, as I showed you earlier in the talk. Habitable zone of our solar system extends out to the Oort cloud. Familiar Earth life with its optimal conditions that I showed in that little green rectangle uh, earlier in the talk uh, seems to be what we are experimentally modeling in the laboratory. Um, this is in opposition to a much larger range of potential environments wherein prebiotic chemistry could have taken place. And I've been trying to encourage my friends in synth synthetic organic chemistry to look into that. I've also argued that liquid water is primordial to the earth. It was not supplied later by comets. And that's heartwarming because I think it's less of a factor in our concerns over uh, whether or not there's uh, water around and planets around other stars, because it's, um, it's all part of the primary accretion process. Something that is often overlooked, and I want to remind everyone of, is that just because water is present doesn't mean that there's life there. You have to maintain chemical disequilibrium over geologic timescales by melting rock. You can't do it in frozen satellites of uh, gas giants of the outer solar system. NASA doesn't listen to me when I say this because they send billion dollar missions like the Europa Clipper, which is going to yield beautiful science, but um, not much information about prebiotic chemistry, I'm afraid. 
The elemental inventories of planets in our galaxy have changed significantly with galaxy evolution. I think I've shown this by both modeling and observation. And the biophilic elements themselves are not in short supply. So there is no limitation to yielding a, uh, a life-giving world, I think. I checked the time. Uh, I have about um, 10 minutes to, to uh, when I'm supposed to end. So I'm going to skip over this and just point out that I've been very interested in, the, in this polluted white dwarf problem. And so I decided that I was going to plot up data for uh, analyzed white dwarfs here in terms of uh, potassium against sodium versus calcium against sodium. Potassium is a moderately volatile element. Calcium is a refractory element. So it tells us something about uh, where and what supply of what rocks uh, polluted these white dwarfs. And arguments have been presented that these white dwarfs were polluted by asteroids and were even stripped continental crusts of planets. I don't see that. Um, in fact, uh, the composition that best matches these analyzed white dwarfs seem to be comets, outer solar system objects. <coughs> very low in calcium sodium ratio and with uh, variability in potassium sodium. To me, this makes sense because to make a white dwarf, you know, you're, you're basically destroying the inner solar systems. So it's hard to see how any planets would survive that process. And then billions of years later, uh, slowly accrete to the surface of these white dwarfs. So, a Jovian analog to orbiting white dwarfs. I mean, a white dwarf is actually not a star, so this is a bit of a misnomer. But I agree with this, that um, that's the most likely uh, way of understanding these systems from direct analysis of composition using chemical principles. So what I talked to you about today, very quickly, is simply not possible unless you've got a whole team of bilge, build, bridge builders with you. Um, my colleagues, uh, Maria Lugaro, Kevin Hang, and Jens Hoymacher, who I mentioned, but also Ramon Brasser, Oleg Abramov, Stephanie Werner, Haiyan Wong, and Rob Spagaden, who I haven't mentioned yet, Thomas Carell, a, a prebiotic chemist, Paul Tackley, who many of you know at ETH said, who were working with an internal models of exoplanets. Craig O'Neill, uh, who was at Macquarie and is associated with uh, us here in Budapest. Elisa Biondi, Georgios uh, Protikakis, who's helping us um, experimentally verify nuclear production rates of things like potassium-40 that heat exoplanet interiors. Christian Kerbel, uh, our colleague up at the uh, University of Vienna, of course, and late accretion, and Gersen and Dugo Ritzen, also for prebiotic studies. And thanks to you um, and colleagues and students, postdocs, and researchers who are attending this, uh, viewing it online. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen, for, for your talk. I think this means that you are at the end. <laughs> and we have lots of times for questions. So maybe to, to start things off, uh, let, let me have a, have a shot on you. Um, you made a, a relatively strong point that you don't expect any life in these subsurface oceans, which uh, you know, some of these icy moons could could provide. Uh, when I now check at your list of necessities of for life, so we have liquid water. That's true. We free energy. Okay, maybe there are some thermal streams under un, in the deep sea. There, why not? Uh, we have time. 
And then you also said about organic building blocks. So, so can I reiterate why you think that this is not possible? It mostly has to do with mass. So uh, masses of objects in the outer solar system are, are small. So these icy worlds, um, even if they started off with a, say a carbonaceous chondrite type inventory of radioactive nuclides, they would have lost the ability to heat their interiors um, many billions of years ago, more than 4 billion years ago. Then you might ask, well, aren't the interiors of some of these objects like Europa uh, warmed by tidal heating? This is true. But what is um, <clears throat> frequently not recognized is that the tidal dissipation is accommodated by the liquid water and the icy shell. It's not from solid tides. So the, tiding, the tidal energy itself in a place like Europa is not like Eo. Eo is melting constantly. That is because it is so close to Jupiter. It has this uh, eccentric orbit that is, um, that is impelled by its interaction between the, the other uh, Galilean satellites. But Europa doesn't have enough intrinsic heating to melt rock in its interior. So these cartoons that you see of black smoker chimneys and so on at the bottom of the Europa ocean are physically impossible. Um, so instead, what happens is that the, the, the mantle of Europa is essentially, I mean, it's warm, it's not hot, and um, cracking occurs, and water percolates into these cracks and hydrates the crust and makes, makes a mineral called serpentine, which is the geological equivalent of soap. And the serpentinization process ran out billions of years ago in a place like Europa. So you have a temperature of two degrees from base to uh, base of the ocean to the base of the ice, which with an occasional incursion from reverse diapirism from the ice, maybe of oxidized components uh, brought to the top of the ice, but um, that's hardly anything. Uh, and my point stands that unless you can melt rock, you cannot maintain free energy from disequilibrium. So, so is this then, you say there's no temperature gradient. So this is the key uh, that, that, that you don't have these gradients which drive some disequilibrium of uh, free energy flows. Well, the free energy, the free energy flow that I described is electrons. You can have ocean currents, but that doesn't mean anything. See, in order to drive chemistry, you have to, you have to be able to, um, chemistry is about moving electrons from one thing to another and back. Um, so if the chemistry is all, always forward chemistry, you run out of the product and then you end up with an accumulation of reactant. Okay, thank you. Or you. You end up with an accumulation of product and you run out of reactant. I did the reverse. Excuse me. So I see Oliver has a question. Oliver. Yes, I actually had a, a rather similar question to that, but um, just, just to follow up, basically. Um, as you said, that basically most of our water is relatively far out, so the habitable zone of having liquid water available would extend from Venus-like to the very end of our solar system. But then your, your, the other argument that we just have discussed, um, basically to, uh, you started saying, yes, there's liquid water, but there is no geology happening, so um, you can't really have life. So that would put the habitable zone in the sense of liquid water that is survivable, or that could form life, only restricted again to the inner parts of the solar system as the traditional habitable zone would be? Or do you also have an idea of like planets that could sustain some geology, which are not actually our, like our uh, icy moons 
in our solar system, but are just slightly different. What's your take on, uh, on that? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's, it's, it's great because I think I see uh, a trap door. And um, you remember this movie Avatar, right? And there's this planet Pandora. Pandora is actually a moon around a super Jupiter. And this moon is the mass of the Earth. So this goes back to my uh, comment that, you know, this, <clears throat> these objects, uh, they're no longer icy moons if their mass is great enough. If you have a super Ganymede, for instance, if you put Earth where Ganymede is, and you, you uh, had tidal heaving of that system, it's conceivable that you could extend the habitable zone thanks to this tidal heating uh, on, a, on a much more massive satellite. And to me, I, this, this is a, a fascinating problem. I am not aware of anyone who's uh, attempted to uh, model the formation of uh, something as large as an Earth mass in a ring of debris around a super Jupiter. I, it's a tractable problem. And if such worlds exist, they wouldn't be planets, they'd be moons. But if such worlds exist, they might be uh, observable. OK, thank you. And then I, we have the next that, question from Nana. Oh, okay, oh sorry. I, I, I just saw, I saw Oliver using some body language that indicates he was less than satisfied with that answer. Uh, well, uh, there, there's there are some other questions that arise uh, next to it for uh, observations of, um, of, of large exomoons on far out orbits, uh, which also becomes quite difficult at some point um, to, to observe that. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting thought, which I haven't really uh, thought about much so uh, that's why my body language indicated there's still let's, some thoughts to be done here <laughs> let's pick let's pick it up at the uh discussion section yes exactly no hey, no nice to see you no no <laughs> hello thank you very much for your presentation it was very interesting um so so i was just wondering if you would elaborate a bit more on like how you would like to define habitable or habitability from like an, an astro uh, an astrogeology perspective, because now usually we would of course do it based on the, the like habitable zone, but like, would you like to have a firm, different definition if you could choose? Um, thank you for the question. I'm going to give you uh, my completely biased uh, opinion and with my personal world expertise in my own opinion, I'm only happy to share. Uh, that um, habitability is that a particular environment is uh, able to sustain the inoculation of some earth life there for an indefinite period. Okay, so you would like to, so, so you would prefer that it is defined only based on earth life? Yes. That's my preference because that's that's the kind of life that we know. Uh, when I give when I give lectures to audiences about um, how do we know what kind of life existed on Earth billions of years ago, I say, well, there are five states of matter in the cosmos, right? There's solid, liquid, gas, plasma, and dark matter. And we have no idea what dark matter is. <laughs> we know it's there because it has mass and affects gravity. Therefore, its gravity affects light. Um, but the only material that, that retains fidelity of information is solid. And so uh, th that's why I don't know. I mean, to me, alien life is like dark matter. I mean, until we discover it, what it is, then we don't know what it is. Uh, we, we, dark matter is even better because we know it's there. 
But there's another thing called um, the shadow biosphere. Maybe you've heard of it. The shadow hey. biosphere is this concept that maybe there's a biosphere that is so utterly different from ours, um, but it exists in parallel with ours, and we should go out and try to look for it. But you know what? There's no evidence for it yet. I mean, philosophically, it's a very interesting question. So um, I, I prefer to be act like a bricklayer. Is start with what I know, and then if something interesting comes along, well, I'll I'll change the way I put my bricks down, but I'll stick with um, these common elements that, you know, make up uh, biology. Okay, very interesting. Thank you for your answer. I appreciate the question. Thank you.